seeing delusion clearly in a flash of insight, we become fed up with our attachment to this mass of suffering and loosen our grip. In that moment of coolness, the fires in our heart abate, and freedom from suffering arises naturally of its own accord. Payam in full bloom. By the middle of October 1952, the payam tree was in full and radiant bloom. Sitting beneath it one afternoon, her mind awash in splendor, Manchi Gao felt the time was right to inform Ajahn Mahabua about her crowning achievement. He was, after all, the inspiration that had led her to this profound, majestic radiance of mind. It was time she repaid his confidence in her with the fruits of her triumph. As it was a lunar observance day, she went to visit him late in the afternoon. She left the nunnery with several nuns as companions, walking together through the fields that rimmed the village until they reached the other side. From there they began the steep climb to Ajahn Mahabua's mountain cave. Seeing Ajahn Mahabua seated at the cave's entrance, Manchi Gao prostrated before her teacher to pay obeisance and exchanged greetings with him. She then bowed her head, pressed her palms together, and asked permission to speak. She spoke of her progress over the past year, carefully detailing the consecutive stages of her experience, and concluded with her lion's roar, the radiant emptiness of mind that permeated the entire cosmos and transcended all conditions. When she stopped speaking, Ajahn Mahabua looked up and calmly asked, Is that all? Mechigao nodded. Ajahn Mahabua paused for a moment and then spoke. When you investigate mental phenomena until you go beyond them completely, the remaining defiling elements of consciousness will be drawn into a radiant nucleus of awareness which merges with the mind's naturally radiant essence. This radiance is so majestic and mesmerizing that even transcendent faculties like spontaneous mindfulness and intuitive wisdom invariably fall under its spell. The mind's brightness and clarity appear to be so extraordinary and awe-inspiring that nothing can possibly compare. The luminous essence is the epitome of perfect goodness and virtue, the ultimate in spiritual happiness. It is your true, original self the core of your being. But this true self is also the fundamental source of all attachment to being and becoming. Ultimately, it is attachment to the allure of this primordial radiance of mind that causes living beings to wander indefinitely through the world of becoming and ceasing, constantly grasping at birth and enduring death. The fundamental cause of that attachment is the very delusion about your true self. Delusion is responsible for all the defiling elements of consciousness, and its avenue of escape is the ongoing momentum of conscious activity. In this sphere, delusion reigns supreme. But once mindfulness and wisdom are skilled enough to eliminate conscious activity and therefore close this outlet, delusions created by the flow of mental phenomena cease. Severing all of its external outflows leaves delusion no room to maneuver inside the mind, forcing it to gather into the radiant nucleus from which all knowing emanates. That center of knowing appears as a luminous emptiness that truly overwhelms and amazes. But that radiant emptiness should not be mistaken for the pure emptiness of Nibbana. The two are as different as night and day. The radiant mind is the original mind of the cycle of constant becoming, but it is not the essence of mind which is fully pure and free from birth and death. Radiance is a very subtle, natural condition whose uniform brightness and clarity make it appear empty. This is your original nature beyond name and form, but it is not yet Nibbana. It is the very substance of mind that has been well cleansed to the point where a mesmerizing and majestic quality of knowing is its outstanding feature. When the mind finally relinquishes all attachments to forms and concepts, the knowing essence assumes exceedingly refined qualities. It has let go of everything except itself. It remains permeated by a fundamental delusion about its own true nature. Because of that, the radiant essence has turned into a subtle form of self without you realizing it. You end up believing that the subtle feelings of happiness and the shining radiance are the unconditioned essence of mind. Oblivious to your delusion, 
You accept this majestic mind as the finished product. You believe it to be Nibbana, the transcendent emptiness of pure mind. But emptiness, radiance, clarity, and happiness are all subtle conditions of a mind still bound by delusion. When you observe the emptiness carefully, with sustained attention, you will observe that it is not really uniform, not really constant. The emptiness produced by primal delusion is the result of subtle conditions. Sometimes it changes a little, just a little, but enough for you to know that it's transient. Subtle variations can be detected because all conditioned phenomena, no matter how refined, bright, and majestic they seem, invariably manifest some irregular symptoms. If it is truly Nibbana, why does this refined state of the mind display a variety of subtle conditions? It is not constant and true. Focus on that luminous center to see clearly that its radiance has the same characteristics of being transient, imperfect, and unessential as all the other phenomena that you have already transcended. The only difference is that the radiance is far more subtle and refined. Try imagining yourself standing in an empty room. You look around and see only empty space everywhere. Absolutely nothing occupies that space. Except you, standing in the middle of the room. Admiring its emptiness, you forget about yourself. You forget that you occupy a central position in that space. How then can the room be empty? As long as someone remains in the room, it is not truly empty. When you finally realize that the room can never be truly empty until you depart, that is the moment when that fundamental delusion about your true self disintegrates and the pure, delusion-free mind arises. Once the mind has let go of phenomena of every sort, the mind appears supremely empty. But the one who admires the emptiness, who is awestruck by the emptiness, that one still survives. The self as reference point, which is the essence of all false knowing, remains integrated into the mind's knowing essence. This self-perspective is the primary delusion. Its presence represents the difference between the subtle emptiness of the radiant mind and the transcendent emptiness of the pure mind, free of all forms of delusion. Self is the real impediment. As soon as it disintegrates and disappears, no more impediments remain. Transcendent emptiness appears. As in the case of a person in an empty room, we can say that the mind is truly empty only when the self leaves for good. This transcendent emptiness is a total and permanent disengagement that requires no further effort to maintain. Delusion is an intrinsically blind awareness masquerading as radiance, clarity, and happiness. As such, it is the self's ultimate safe haven. But those treasured qualities are all products of subtle causes and conditions. True emptiness occurs only when every single trace of one's conditioned reality disappears. As soon as you turn around and know it for what it is, that false awareness simply disintegrates. Clouding your vision with its splendor, that luminous deception has all along been concealing the mind's true, natural wonder. Returning to the nunnery that evening, Mechi Gao reflected on how the radiant mind had become her sole lingering attachment. Cherishing and safeguarding it more than anything else, she hardly wanted to interfere with it. Within the entire mind and body, nothing stood out so prominently as that luminance. It provoked such a riveting sense of inner amazement and consequently such a protective feeling of attachment that she wanted nothing to disturb it. Because of Machi Gao's delusion about the mind essence that knows all things, she forgot to investigate and pass judgment on the true nature of that essence. When the scope of the mind drew inward, it gathered itself into a radiant nucleus, bright, cheerful, and bold. Every mental act arose from that nucleus. Consciousness flowed from that nucleus. Thoughts formed there. All happiness seemed to gather there, so she had believed that it must be Nibbana, the center of her being that was so bright and clear all the time, but she now realized that it was actually the nucleus of the origin of suffering. Fearless and unshakable, Mechi Gao began to meticulously scrutinize her mind's extraordinary radiance, looking for any signs of imperfection. The luminous mind appeared unblemished, 
untroubled, and exceedingly pure at first. But when she looked at it more closely, she began to notice that an equally refined dullness occasionally emerged to tarnish that radiant, crystal-clear essence of knowing. This irregularity caused an equally subtle form of dissatisfaction and uncertainty to slip in. The minute fluctuations that she observed revealed enough variance to make her suspicious and to encourage her to persevere. Eventually she became so absorbed in attending to those fluctuations that she lost all sense of time. She completely forgot the time of day, the time for sleep, and even how tired she was. Without letting up, she continued for days on end, noting the slightest inconsistencies as they arose, until all certainty about the radiant awareness eroded and disappeared. With the first light of dawn, on November 1st, 1952, Mechi Gao sensed that her body was tired. With perfect mindfulness, she had been walking barefoot on her meditation path for hours. She decided to rest for a while before going to the kitchen to prepare food for the monk's alms round. The first clear rays of dawn were beginning to illuminate the topmost foliage of the payom tree, bathing its yellow flowers in the soft glow of imminent awakening. She walked slowly to the bamboo platform under the tree and sat perfectly still for a long moment, a moment of deep, still, unfocused calm. A prolonged lull ensued where nothing moved forward, nothing moved back, and nothing stood still. Then, aware but knowing nothing in particular, suspended in emptiness, the crystal clear radiance of mind she had treasured for so long suddenly turned and dissolved, revealing a pure, all-knowing presence that filled the heart and pervaded the entire universe. The knower was everywhere, but nothing was known. Without characteristics and without source, emanating from no point in particular, knowing was simply a spontaneous happening of cosmic expanse. The radiant awareness had dissolved in an instant, leaving only purity of mind and the essential freedom of pure tamma, an absolutely unconditioned knowing that entirely transcended all forms of human conception. Body, mind, and essence are all distinct and separate realities. Absolutely everything is known, earth, water, fire, and wind, body, feeling, memory, thought, and consciousness, sounds, sights, smells, tastes, touches, and emotions, anger, greed, and delusion, all are known. I know them all as they exist, in their own natural states. But no matter how much I am exposed to them, I am unable to detect even an instant when they have any power over my heart. They arise, they cease, they are forever changing, but the presence that knows them never changes for an instant. It is forever unborn and undying. This is the end of all suffering.